1942, a batch of early M1 bazookas reaches British commanders in Egypt for evaluation. They arrange a demonstration against a captured Panzer III. The rocket hits, it penetrates, the weapon works, and the British say no thank you. This was not arrogance. This was not bureaucratic stubbornness. The British had already begun production of something different, something that looked crude, felt brutal, and operated on principles the Americans had rejected. The Piat weighed nearly twice as much as the bazooka. It required enormous physical strength just to cock. Soldiers cursed it, struggled with it, and in some cases physically could not operate it. But it could do something the bazooka never could. It could fire from inside a building without killing everyone behind the operator. In the hedgerow fighting of Normandy, the rubble of Italian towns and the desperate house-to-house -house combat at Arnhem, that single advantage proved decisive. According to British Army analysis of the initial overlord period, Piat teams destroyed 7% of all German tanks knocked out by British forces. That figure exceeded the kill rate of RAF rocket-firing typhoons, a weapon that looked like a plumber's nightmare outperformed aircraft. The problem both weapons tried to solve was simple to state and terrifying to face. German armour had outpaced infantry anti-tank weapons. By 1941, British soldiers confronting Panzer III's and IVs had few options. The boy's anti-tank rifle, firing a .55 calibre round, could penetrate 21 millimetres of armour at 300 yards. German tanks now carried 30 to 50 millimetres of frontal protection, often sloped. The boys was obsolete before the war properly began. Anti-tank guns worked, but they weighed thousands of pounds and required vehicles to move. Infantry needed something a single soldier could carry into combat, something that could kill a tank at ranges where the tank could kill you first. The shaped charge, exploiting what physicists called the Munro effect, offered a theoretical solution. A cone of copper, backed by explosive, could upon detonation collapse into a hypersonic jet. This jet could punch through armour far thicker than any kinetic projectile of equivalent size. The challenge was delivering that shape charge to the target. The Americans chose rockets, the Germans chose rockets, the British chose a spring. Lieutenant Colonel Latham Valentine Stuart Blacker was not a conventional weapons designer. An Indian Army veteran and early aviation enthusiast, he had spent years tinkering with unconventional ordnance concepts. He patented his spigot mortar design in 1930 and spent a decade trying to interest the military. The principle was counterintuitive. Instead of launching a projectile from inside a barrel, the spigot mortar used a solid steel rod. The bomb sat over this rod, its hollow tail containing a small propellant charge. When fired, the rod struck the propellant and the resulting explosion launched the bomb forward while simultaneously driving the rod backward. All the energy went into the projectile. There was no tube to contain expanding gases. There was no backblast. After Dunkirk, desperation opened doors. Churchill witnessed a demonstration of Blacker's first creation, the Blacker Bombard, a 112-pound fixed-mount weapon firing 20-pound anti-tank bombs. Over 22,000 were produced for the Home Guard, but Blacker envisioned something portable. When he demonstrated his shoulder-fired version to the War Office in June 1941, everything went wrong. The casing was flimsy. The spigot misfired. Bombs failed to detonate on contact. The Ordnance Board's verdict was devastating. They declared the weapon would prove ineffective as an anti-tank weapon under any conceivable conditions of employment. Blacker was transferred to other duties, but Major Millis Jeffress at MD-1, Churchill's secret weapons laboratory nicknamed the Toy Shop, saw potential. He combined the spigot concept with newly available hollow-charge warhead technology developed for the No. 74 ST grenade, better known as the Sticky Bomb. By early 1942, the Jeffress shoulder gun was impressing the same officials who had rejected Blacker's prototype. Production began in August 1942 at ACR Billingham, a full month before the American bazookas arrived for evaluation. The finished Piet, an abbreviation for Projector Infantry Anti-Tank, weighed 32 pounds. It measured 39 inches in length and fired a 3.5-inch diameter bomb. Muzzle velocity reached 250 feet per second, relatively slow, giving the weapon an effective range of roughly 100 to 115 yards against moving targets. Soldiers who used it claimed 50 yards was more realistic. 
armor penetration reached 75 to 100 mm, sufficient against the sides and rear of any German tank then in service. The cocking mechanism was the source of endless complaint. The operator had to stand, place the weapon on its butt, step on the shoulder padding, quarter turn to unlock the spring and haul upward with their entire body weight. This required around 200 pounds of force. Shorter soldiers sometimes physically could not do it. One training manual noted that the recocking process while lying prone was possible, but required practice and considerable strength. The American M1 bazooka took a different approach. Weighing just 18 pounds, it used a battery-powered ignition system to fire a 2.36-inch rocket. The rocket motor burned solid propellant, accelerating the projectile to 265 feet per second. Effective range reached 150 yards, marginally better than the Piat. Armor penetration of 76 millimeters was comparable. Operation was simpler. A two-man team could fire and reload rapidly, but every advantage came with a cost. When that rocket motor ignited, propellant gases screamed out the rear of the tube, creating a danger zone of 15 meters behind the operator. The distinctive whoosh and smoke trail immediately revealed the shooter's position. Anyone standing behind the weapon risked severe burns or death. On dry ground, the backblast kicked up dust clouds visible for hundreds of yards. In enclosed spaces, firing was suicidal. The Piat had no such limitation. The infantry school at Hythe ran Piat training courses until 1959, specifically noting that the weapon could be fired from indoors if need be. Over 200 Piat units were airdropped to the French resistance specifically because operatives could fire them from inside buildings, attack German vehicles, and disappear before the enemy located their position. At Arnhem, British paratrooper records noted that Piat teams proved difficult to locate in built-up areas. The weapons report was a dull thud rather than the bazooka's screaming whoosh. The Piat's combat debut came in early 1943 during the Tunisia campaign. Canadian forces used Piat units extensively during the Sicily invasion in July 1943, though early reports complained of misfires and unreliable fuses that sometimes failed to detonate unless striking armour squarely. Now, before we get into the Victoria Cross actions, if you are finding this useful, subscribing to the channel genuinely helps. It takes a second, costs nothing, and supports more deep dives like this one. Right, back to the Piat. By 1944, the weapon had proven itself repeatedly. A Canadian Army survey questioning 161 officers recently returned from combat ranked the Piat as the number one most outstandingly effective infantry weapon, placing it ahead of the legendary Bren gun. Six Victoria Crosses were awarded for actions involving Piat weapons, more than any other infantry anti-tank system of the war. Fusilier Francis Jefferson earned his at Monte Cassino in May 1944. When the first Piat team was killed, the 23-year-old seized the weapon, ran forward under direct fire, and engaged a German tank at close range. The vehicle burst into flames. At that distance, missing meant death. He did not miss. Major Robert Kane became the only Arnhem Victoria Cross recipient to survive the battle. Over six days of combat, he disabled or forced off multiple armoured vehicles using Piet weapons. Later accounts credited him with even higher totals. On September 20th, 1944, a Piat bomb detonated prematurely in his face, temporarily blinding him. While being dragged to safety, witnesses reported him screaming for someone to grab the Piat. His sight returned after 30 minutes. He refused evacuation. Both eardrums burst from constant firing. He stuffed field dressings in his ears and continued fighting. Private Ernest Smokey Smith earned his Victoria Cross at the Savio River in Italy in October 1944. Leading a Piat team across open ground under fire from three Panthers, two self-propelled guns, and thirty infantry, Smith engaged the lead Panther at thirty feet and destroyed it. When ten German infantry charged him with Schmeisses, he killed four with his Thompson submachine gun and drove back the rest while protecting his wounded comrade. Sergeant Wagger Thornton of the Oxen Bucks Light Infantry, famous for the Pegasus Bridge assault, offered a harsher assessment despite these successes. He called the Piet a load of rubbish, claiming the realistic range was around 50 yards and no more. He added a critical warning, you must never miss. If you do, you have had it, because by the time you reload the thing and cock it, which is a bloody chore on its own, everything is gone, you are done. The recoil was legendary. 
One soldier in Italy shot at a panther while standing and was completely knocked over despite scoring a hit. The twelve-pound spigot lurching forward a tenth of a second before firing made accurate aiming difficult. Soldiers learned to brace themselves to fire from prone positions whenever possible and to accept that operating the weapon was a physical ordeal. The bazooka's combat record proved more troubled. The M1 first saw action during Operation Torch in November 1942, but training had been rushed and results were poor. An American general visiting Tunisia afterward could not find any soldiers who could report that the weapon had actually stopped an enemy tank. By May 1943, further M1 bazooka issue was suspended due to the unreliable M6 rocket. The battery-powered ignition system created constant problems. In humid conditions, the contacts corroded. In salt air, they failed. In cold weather, the rocket propellant did not fully burn inside the tube, extending past the muzzle and increasing danger to the operator. Bazooka operators faced high risk at the close ranges the weapon required. The backblast revealed their position immediately, and reloading under fire was difficult. General Patton himself was blunt about the weapon's limitations. He stated that the purpose of the bazooka is not to hunt tanks offensively, but to be used as a last resort. He recommended the range should be held to around 30 yards. At that distance, against a moving tank, survival was unlikely regardless of whether you hit or missed. Both weapons struggled against heavy German armour. By 1943, Germany had deployed Schürzen, armoured side skirts originally introduced to counter anti-tank rifles. These skirts also provided some protection against hollow charge weapons by creating standoff distance and sometimes causing premature detonation. A 1943 US intelligence bulletin confirmed the 2.36-inch bazooka-shaped charge could not penetrate Tiger frontal armour. The Piat faced identical problems. Both weapons required flanking shots against heavy armour, dangerous work at close engagement ranges. The Germans captured and studied bazookas in Tunisia and quickly recognised the concept's value. By late 1943, they had fielded the Panzerschreck, essentially a scaled-up bazooka with an 88mm warhead, capable of penetrating around 160mm of armour superior to the American original. American intelligence called the Panzerschreck clumsier than the bazooka and reputedly less accurate. But its hitting power was undeniable, and American troops who encountered captured German anti-tank weapons sometimes preferred them to their issued bazookas. Korea exposed the bazooka's inadequacy definitively. At the Battle of Osan on July 5, 1950, 2nd Lieutenant Ollie Connor maneuvered to close range behind a T-34-85 tank, targeting its weakest armour and fired 22 bazooka rockets with little effect. The urgent development of the M20 Super Bazooka, a 3.5-inch design, was the direct result. The spigot mortar concept died with the Piat. No successor was developed. The design was too heavy, too complex, and too limited in range to justify continuation. The Piat served through the Korean War before retirement in the early 1950s, when the British Army adopted the American M20 Super Bazooka as its replacement. The bazooka's lineage, by contrast, runs directly to modern weapons. Germany's Panzerschreck, essentially a scaled-up copy of the captured American design, influenced post-war development. Soviet designers combined bazooka reloadability with Panzerfaust warhead concepts to create the RPG-2 in 1949 and eventually the RPG-7 in 1961, the most widely used anti-tank weapon in history. The M72, LAW, AT-4, NLAW, and Javelin all trace their ancestry to the shoulder-fired shaped charge concept the bazooka pioneered. Britain's decision was not about national pride. The timeline reveals pragmatic calculation. The Piat was already in production when bazookas arrived for evaluation. British manufacturing capacity was committed. More importantly, British tactical doctrine anticipated the urban combat, defensive positions and concealment requirements, where the Piat excelled. For fighting in buildings, from trenches and in close terrain, zero backblast was not merely an advantage, it was survival. The numbers validate the choice. 7% of German tanks destroyed by British forces in the critical early overlord period fell to Piat teams, six Victoria Crosses, over 115,000 units produced, a Canadian army survey naming it the most effective infantry weapon of the war. Against these results, the bazooka offered lighter weight and easier operation, meaningful advantages that did not outweigh the Piat's tactical flexibility in British hands. 
the Piet was an evolutionary dead end. The bazooka was an ancestor, but in the brutal fighting of 1943 to 1945, the weapon that mattered was the one that worked when you needed it. For British soldiers fighting in the hedgerows of Normandy and the ruins of Arnhem, that weapon was the crude, heavy, shoulder-bruising Piat. Britain said no to America's bazooka because British engineers had already built something better suited to British needs. The combat record proved them right. 